Hello, welcome to the Breakthrough Hiring Show. I'm your host, James Mackey. Very excited for today's episode. We are da- uh, joined by David Hanoran. David, thank you for joining me today. James, thanks for having me. Yeah, let's jump into it. So we have a lot of exciting topics today, actually some of which we haven't discussed on the show. So everybody tuning in, this is going to be a good one for you. Uh, before we get started, David, could you please share a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, so I'm David. I'm Chief People Officer at a company called Flare, which is a legal tech company. I can share more about them in a minute. I've I've been there since January, but I've been in this line of work for over 20 years. Um, I started in a very different industry, but for the vast majority of that 20 plus years, I've been in in tech. So, um, you know, Electronic Arts is one of the bigger such companies I was at um, earlier in my career, but really... um, I would say that most of my time has been in what I'll call growth um, stage tech companies, places like Twitter, um, Zendesk, Eventbrite more recently as some recognizable companies. Maybe there were a few hundred employees going to a few thousand, you know, maybe they were just pre IPO, um, you know, and then they were going through some liquidity event or going public, or they were just, you know, just public as of a year or two prior to me joining them. So there's a stage there. Of, of a few hundred going to a few thousand employees I've really enjoyed because it's like we've got product market fit, maybe we're series B or later, we see this growth potential for us. And the co-founder, the CEO, the co-founders, they they desire um, a lot from their people team to sort of up-level in all sorts of people practices. They see the connection between culture and their ability to deliver on the business, and deliver their c- customers. And so that, that's where a lot of my impact has been is coming in helping people teams up level, helping to bridge sort of ideas of the co-founders and the exec team to the people team and creating alignment there and ultimately just creating high performance, highly engaged, like really best in class workplaces that are delivering high performance. I love it. That's We're going to have such a good conversation. I, a quick question. So I, you're, you were at Electronics uh, Arts. Were you there? I think you were there at the same time as Steve Cadigan, right? I, yeah, Steve and I. Yeah, Steve is one of my one of my favorites. So he he left when I was there. He left to to um go to this company we never heard of called LinkedIn. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go be their first uh, VP of people. Uh, and we were like, okay, wow, never heard of them. And uh, you know, ha- had a great career. And I think that was it for him. And then he moved into his um you know kind of consulting and, and influencer career. But Steve's great. Yeah, he's on uh, he's on my board for Secure Vision. He's awesome. So I've, I've worked with him for uh, several years and I've, uh, I've always had a, a really great experience. So that's a small world. It's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. Well, hey, look, we the, the first topic to dive in today, we wanted to talk about uh, the current market conditions. A lot of organizations are over the past nine months have gone through reorganizations, uh, layoffs, and really at its core, it's like a, a true transformation in terms of how businesses are operating and thinking about uh, doing the best they can in this market conditioning and uh, condition and pos- uh, positioning themselves for the future. I, I think it's, it could be quite challenging, right? It's, it's, it's how do, how do companies recover from going through a reorg and layoffs? I, I think it's hard because our, our focus seems to be like, we have to be really dialed into revenue retention these types of things. And it's, it's at the same time, it's, we have the employee experience and we have a team that we need to heal and make sure that employee engagement is strong. So what, what are you seeing out there? Like how, how do you think about how executives can help their company kind of overcome some of the challenges of, you know, post layoff and, and making sure that folks stay engaged? Well, you know, if you zoom out to this and, and, and think back to, I don't know, 2020, 2021, all right, great resignation, um, the, the shift to remote work, pandemic induced, lots of venture capital out in the market, um, lots of e-commerce companies and companies that were like, you know, growing because of a lot of consumer shifts from COVID um, created this, I think, a very different challenge for CEOs and chief people officers, which is how do I retain all this talent? How do I compete with these, with these thing companies to retain my talent, to, to hire people that I need? And, and it, it just the, the massive shift that has happened just in the span of, of a year or two to now it is, how do we do more with less? There's no more venture capital out there or it's very little. We, it's much more competitive and it's less of the employee's market, more of the employer's market. Um, that, that can feel like really disorienting around sort of having a coherent view as a chief people officer or CEO. What are our sensibilities? What do we believe? What do we believe about our culture? And then how does that change um, in terms of how we manage it? 
But um, just if I was to look up at some of the stats here uh, at, a, at like a website called trueup.io slash layoffs, I think um, it, it looks like early in the year was some of the peak activity for layoffs. So it, it looks as if, you know, the, potentially, and I'm an optimist, but it looks as if at least in tech, um, layoffs have, have lessened a little bit as we've gone from January to the middle of summer. But like my company's not immune to it, my, com my prior company's not immune to it. And back to your question, I found that what, what has happened just when, when I've been in the mode of, of having to assist a, a team or a company to navigate that, navigate, hey, we have a reduction here we need to manage through in order to, to continue to be viable. There's a lot of energy that's placed into getting through that day of, of getting through, we know we need to cut, now let's go back and forth. How, like, what are our assumptions on that? How do we approach this? What all is, is factored in here? Is it just headcount? Is it non-headcount optics? You, you place a lot of energy into that and it can be draining and it can lead you to believe that once we get through it and once we communicate on the day of, our work is really done. But just thinking about my Eventbrite example, the work in terms of that as a change management exercise, we're just we're going to transform the company. We're letting go of twenty percent of the company, of fifty percent of the company. That is suddenly a new chapter you're opening as a company, and it's essentially starting with a very bad story. The first few paragraphs of this chapter are bad. You know, it is morale plummets. We're having to to let go of people who we like, you know, were beloved and by many others, and 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 that's that's the start of the chapter. The rest of the chapter is the transformation. And so when I was at Eventbrite, I remember this moment. And so the Eventbrite riff um, in April 2020, it was really born out of the fact that live experiences were suddenly going to come to a standstill. So Eventbrite as a company pre-pandemic going well, there was about a year and a half post IPO. I joined them in November 2019. Q1 rolls around. We're kicking off. We're having worldwide kickoffs. And gosh, this is going to be a great year. And there's this little news thing we keep seeing every once in a while, something out of China that feels a little bit concerning. And it was like, it was so swift how it suddenly just changed the live experiences industry. Um, smaller competitors were going out of business. And, and we went through a series of like really sort of white knuckle decisions to figure out what are we, how are we going to navigate this? And one important principle that Julia, the CEO, and uh, I credit her for, for uh, rallying us around this is we're going to emerge from the stronger. And so if you can think about it back to that time, emerging stronger from a pandemic that's going to wipe out live experiences for the foreseeable future was really hard to buy. And yet that was her perspective. And so we were able to do that because I think we saw a number of decisions that we could do that, like, hey, if we do this, if we're going to build this company all over again, if we could start over tear it down to the studs and build this all over again, what decisions would we choose now that we couldn't, if not for this, this massive like sea change in, in our industry? And so we made a conscious decision, we're going to emerge from the stronger. And so I think some companies don't do that when they're navigating, hey, we're talking to the board, the board is telling us we're going to have to cut by 20% or, or they're giving us that feedback and now we're, okay, we've aligned at a cut. What they, what they orient around is let's get through the cut instead of let's do this and emerge stronger. So I think that's one big principle that companies that if they're facing this now should should consider. I love that. I think that that's a, a really powerful insight. I actually wrote that down. We're going to put that probably somewhere in the in the description. Um, so I think that like let's let's talk about from a operational structure. How do you even start thinking about that? So you're you're you have the kind of the mission of okay, we're going to come out this stronger. We're going to make a lot of uh, core changes that maybe we couldn't, uh, you know, before. Um, what places do you do you really look to, and then how do you actually get the the buy in from the organization? I mean, is it is it really just like presenting the mission of like, hey, we're going to come out of this stronger, or are there other things that you're doing for employee engagement? So I just more specifically with where your focus is going yeah. and, and what high leverage things can you do? Yeah, so we'll kind of start start the initial planning stage, which is. There's there's probably some conversation, and then the chief people officer is, is pulled in, ideally very early. But it's we're we're looking at this number, we're all eyes on this number of like, okay, we there's no way around it. We need to cut somehow, and and so we've we've gone back and forth with the board on an overall opex cut that we have to that we have to navigate. And now it's how do we get there? And uh, I'll I'll sort of uh, I'll credit um, Colleen McCreary is someone who when it, when she was at Credit Karma. 
she said she pushed on the idea of does it have to be a layoff can we just do can we do salary reductions for all employees can we do something here other than cutting jobs because if if we need all these jobs then we're just going to you know we're going to hurt ourselves ultimately by cutting jobs that we need so so you you first start with what is the number what is the goal what is ultimate what are we trying to accomplish here if it's just cutting is that all we're trying to accomplish are we trying to accomplish something else we're trying to accomplish a change we're going to change how we how we manage customer service. We're, we're, there's a business change here. In, in, the, in the case of Eventbrite, we decided we we're going to um, exit a bunch of markets and we we're going to focus just on seven core markets. We we're going to not be um, a, a vertical business, but a horizontal business. And we we're going to lean into self-serve instead of like a really heavy sales approach. So there was there's probably some overarching principles there on the business that we're trying to achieve. And the cut is going to be one way that we accomplish that. Um, then I think what's important early on is to think about your principles for how we're going to navigate this. Potentially, some of the values of the company help us determine how we're going to manage this, this painful situation. And so one example that I'll use is um, at my current company, my last company, when we had to go through this, um, part of the nature of the values was really about um, how much we valued each other and live interactions and, and the sort of the human interaction. So the companies that have decided to lay people off over email and like, hey, it's just going to be a transaction. We're going to cut this person. They're just going to wake up and like they, no one talks to them. They just get an email is very different to, you know, that's that's not how we operate as this business. This, these are tough decisions. that involve humans. So, so I think you start with some, you start with like, what are the business objectives? And then what are sort of like the human objectives? What are the principles, the values that we're going to, that we're going to navigate um, through this? I think I've I've found it's important to have like then to create a structure around that. Who's part of the core team? Who are the stakeholders? Who's project managing it? And then start to create the the sort of timeline for ourselves. Um, I'll stop there and see what questions emerge for you. But those those are kind of three things: the sort of you know the business objectives, and it's not just about a number, but it's also about something else we're trying to achieve as part of this, which is back to like we're going to emerge stronger, we're going to achieve these business objectives, and hopefully emerge as a stronger business. The right. second are principles for how we're going to navigate this. I'll credit two people, my prior team, Tanya, and my current team, Meredith, is like, you know, that's where their heads go as well. And then thirdly is start to create a structure by which we're going to stay connected, communicate. These are private conversations. Are we creating a Slack channel? Are we creating a cadence by which we're going to actually sort of manage um, the project team, project timeline? Um, and then and a host of things sort of emerge from, from, from those three. Right. And I think what we, in our prep call, we actually wrote down several things that are mistakes that organizations make as well. Um, like, so they might, I think one thing you mentioned is like, they might make the strategic shift in terms of this is, okay, this is, even if they get it right in terms of this is how a cut's going to play into a strategic shift, right? To come out stronger. Um, maybe they're not thinking about operationally building out the right processes that are aligned with that, right? So like, I think the example you might have given is like, okay, you're going to be making this push into enterprise, but the way that things are structured from a process perspective don't necessarily reflect uh, that shift in strategy, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I've seen mistakes here in the past where we say the business, um, we're moving from you know a, a very sales-driven business model to a tech-driven model. So meaning we're going to create technology that is so easy to use and, and so appealing that we're not going to need as big a sales team. And in fact, some of the sales operations or some, some of the functions there, which is like, they just, there's not a place for them in this new model. Um, so do we have the tech team to do it? You know, do we have the designers? Do we have the leadership there? Is there a structure there? Do we have, do we have retention hooks in the, in the key talent that are going to like really deliver the plan? And so, um, we we realized at Eventbrite that you know once we navigated this we're going to have a lot of flight risks and so we we put um, we put some special stock plans together for where we where we had risk where we had uh, concerns around key talent that's not a panacea though that doesn't solely solve for that um, in some cases you might have big holes so like we're actually going to need to recruit so at, at at Eventbrite you know we were leaning we were basically saying we're going to have a self serve product that's the vision. And so it's going to change the makeup of the company. It's going to change where like the center of gravity goes. We didn't have a CTO at the time. So we were going out with this message to the, to the company of like, this is what we're going to do. And one of the first questions is how we're going to do that without a CTO. So, you know, we need to recruit a CTO. Um, but this is, 
this is again, if, if you don't have sight of what the longer term business objectives are and what are, what are the assumptions, what, are the, what, what must be true for us to accomplish this? Um, I think a, a guy, Huggy Rao, maybe coined the term pre-mortem, like let's pre-mortem if this fails, like what's gonna, what's gonna cause this transformation, this, this reorganization to fail? That would be one such example as if we just don't have the tech team to you know, achieve this big pivot. Right. And I just to dial in on attrition, right? Like folks that might be leaving after you go through a layoff. Did that fear, has that fear in your career, like, or not fear, but like, has that theory kind of come to pass where you've seen that? I mean, because like one of my initial thoughts is, well, sure, like you're going through layoffs, but other companies are as well. So are you actually seeing increased attrition? I mean, my experience is limited in that my company secure vision it's embedded recruiting and rpo so it's like when we do layoffs everyone else in our industry is like kind of tied at the hip like everybody's doing them and like internal companies are laying off recruiters so we don't see additional attrition from the remaining staff but i'm sure there's of course many different situations of companies in different industries within tech right uh that maybe that's more the case so i'm just curious like has that really come to pass and to what extent yeah, I can call it a few different examples or a few experiences. And, and maybe it's different right now with the very changing tech market. So if, if I'm an employee and I, I've seen uh, my company go through a riff, am I in the same mental spot as I was during the great resignation when I've got recruiters, you know, um, sort of barging down my door? Um, I think even, even in cases of like uh, other functions and, and dev functions, I think it's maybe a little bit different than it was at the height of the craziness during the great resignation. However, in general, my experience is, yes, as soon as you go through a riff, you, you have this morale plummet, which then has a connection to ultimate regretted attrition or, or voluntary attrition out the door. And, and there's a bit of a lag there in terms of like, okay, wow, news here. And then in the, in the ensuing 60 days, then you might start to see something pick up because people are suddenly answering the phone calls, but it takes about 60 days to get through an interview process or, or so to decide what you want to do next. So, so you are at risk as a company to attrition or at least disengagement morale plummeting in the period right after your RIF, somewhat commensurate, according to the research I've seen, somewhat commensurate to the size of your RIF and how well you managed it. So when I was at EA many, many years ago, it's probably a very different company than it is now, but, but the gaming industry at that time would do like successive riffs. So meaning they would just like a game would close and they would riff that team or, or a portion of the team and then reassign them elsewhere. Or at, at, at EA, we just kind of struggled with like every year there was a riff. And so it just became a bit of a running joke of like, when's the riff for this year? And that exacerbates attrition when you, when you like, as some, someone once told me, you want to like cut once and deep as opposed to We've had to sort of cut three times in a row this year. That just erodes trust. To build trust back, you have to have a plan that is going to work. And like, hey, if we execute on this plan, watch and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Hard to sort of say that's true if six months later we're, we're doing it again. And so I think that puts puts a challenge uh, on the people teams and the leaders to sort of to build confidence back if you're if you're cutting multiple times, which we did at EA yeah. um, at at Eventbrite. We had a very large riff. It was almost half the company. And yeah, the, the morale just plummeted. We put retention hooks in, in a lot of our staff in terms of in forms of equity. Um, you know, we we did what we could around sort of culture initiatives, but that first few months afterwards, it was like, whoa, it's it's heightened. But it, then it started to drop off when when on both the people plans, on what we're gonna do culturally to sort of rebound, as well as the business, once we could show wins in the quarters down the road. Then you start to see this lessening of the attrition and a, an uptick in the engagement. And so by the time I was leaving Eventbrite, engagement was higher than it was before the RIF and, and attrition was down. So, but that that takes time. I think it's it takes time to really rebuild the engagement and it, and it takes consistency and, and being able to point to wins and, and not leaving people with the impression that like something here's not working if we're riffing again six months later, nine months later. That's all really interesting and something that just kind of that I was thinking about as you were talking was, I think I initially thought of it when you were talking about electronic arts, but the concept of talent management systems and being able to reallocate folks onto different teams. I think that that's like, theoretically, it's, it seems pretty straightforward, but 
for a lot of companies, that's really difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, the companies you worked for, have you seen any companies do that really well? Like when companies start to get to, you know, a few hundred employees plus, maybe that's when they start thinking about this. Um, but it seems that a lot of companies almost would prefer to just cut deep and rehire versus like, they don't necessarily have really built out talent management programs or systems to where they can try to plug people into different roles. And of course you have differences of skill sets that could be an issue. And then the organization behind it can be really difficult. It takes a lot of time and energy resources. What I, you could start wherever you want philosophically specific, specific examples, but I, I would love to learn from you here on this one. Yeah. I think there is probably a, a difference if you're like small series a, we've got a hundred employees and like making payroll each month, the amount of money we have in the bank is very different than an EA where, or, you know, just a larger company where, you know, like we can try something out for a bit to see what works here. Um, or we're so large where we're finding pockets of talent that have somewhat overlapping skill sets. So could, um, you know, could recruiters move into customer roles? Could customer roles move into sourcing roles? Could, um, you know, could we, could we put some folks into SDR roles, you know, as a trial for a period of time? I know that some companies um, try and maybe consider furloughs or something like that. But in my last company, Eventbrite, we had to let some of the recruiting team go, but we kept a, a sizable um, contingent that didn't have any recruiting to do for a few, a few, a few months. And what we did was we had them help affected staff find new jobs. So their 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 goal for two, three months was not to recruit, but to actually help folks find new jobs. And that was with the belief that ultimately we're going to need a team here. We don't know when we're going to need a team. And it happened because we were starting to lose some folks and there was an opportunity. We're going to recruit some new folks who, who buy into this vision which then helps the engagement and helps like, hey, we're getting people who are mission aligned now with this new this new strategy we have. And the, thank goodness we have a recruiting team that we saved there. Um, I think at the at the smaller levels, I've seen some companies um, consider, um, you know, uh, having a, an intact team, whether it's customer service, a sales team, maybe even a dev team um, that are outsourced to another company. With with for a few months we don't have work. One I, one of my colleagues I saw mm. um, had his recruiting team actually assigned to helping other companies recruit talent for their companies because he he was just c confident that he needed a recruiting team. He just didn't have the need for it now. So maybe some other maybe another company will pay me for my team as a loan so that they can be assigned to another company and I just get we get paid for that to navigate through this period. So. Um, harder for, I think it's harder for smaller companies, but there's, there's definitely ideas and there's ways you can navigate that. I think it's like, gets back to what you're saying about how you handle the riff, right? Like if you can, what you're saying about reallocating recruiters time to helping folks on your team find their next role. It also gives people confidence, like, okay, that you, okay, you really do care about people. And then two, if there is another round of layoffs, like they're not going, they're not going to be on the street, right? They have a severance, a severance package and they have uh, help, right? Uh, people that are, are going to help them find the next role, which I think it's like one of the, I don't know, maybe this was a Steve Cadigan line, but I, I can't remember. I, I just heard from someone it was like, you know, the, the, the way you handle uh, rifts is just as much for the people that stay as for the people that leave. Like you're, when you're, when you're thinking about severance packages, you're, you're also thinking about it from the perspective of how is this going to be received uh, for the people that stay with your organization? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I believe that for sure. And there's a there's a desire for the staying employees to know how the exiting employees were treated. So, you know, just to sort of say, hey, we're gonna have a private conversation with these individuals who are impacted is probably not sufficient. Like being more transparent around this is the process we went through. This is the why. Here's here's okay, we're in an all hands the day after we 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 went through this event, there was an email about it. Now let's lean into over communicating because everyone's heightened attention to this worried. There's a level of fear here for even the staying employees and concern for how we treated people. Let's lean into that because we're going to have to build trust back. That's what you're dealing with is, is trust, respect, confidence has suddenly plummeted and you can't just say we're done and okay, yeah, we, we had a riff, but now we're moving on. You have to lean into the fact that people are going to be anxious and, and curious about information. So 
we would lean into sharing, here's the why, here's what led us to that, here's what we considered around that, here was, here's all that was affected and why, um, even down to like teams and sort of impact and why. Um, and then how do we treat um, the staff who are affected? And then what is the go forward? So at a certain point, you guys start talking about the go forward and how we're gonna measure this. What are the KPI, what are the metrics that were important for us? What is What shifts, what implications does this have on the next quarter and how we should be thinking about goals and how people should be really leaning into it. Um, I think that there's an example, um, Etsy. Etsy had a riff, I think in 2018, where they've written case studies on this, but it was basically the CEO said, we're gonna radically focus. We're gonna move away from some uh, product areas and, and business um, opportunities that have not panned out for us. We're gonna go back to what's important for our, um, our creators and our, and our customers. And that was part of it, but a big part of the success was the cultural urgency internally afterwards. So the culture, understanding the mission, like the sort of patterns the practices going back to what the goals are, and but ultimately just creating an urgency and a mission alignment to what we're doing, which takes time. But that, that was one of the reasons why their, their turnaround, when you look at their stock price, was, was so effective was just the sort of cultural rebound. Well, so one, one of the things, and I'll be honest, like I've struggled with a couple of the things that you're saying. One, for my company, most of my employees are billable. And so I wasn't able to do one riff because I, it was based on market demand, which for about a six month, month period was declining. So as we had more customer churn, I had to lay additional people off, which was a huge struggle from a morale perspective because people felt like they were just getting beaten down. And you're trying to like maintain this culture saying, hey, guys, we're going to find a plateau. We don't know exactly where it's going to be. Fortunately, we found that for the past uh, four or five, four months or so, uh, where I think the market, like from a layoff perspective and from a hiring demand perspective has leveled out. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't clear cut. And this was, by the way, like every company in my industry, <laughs> like I was talking to CEOs, my competitors, like it's funny. It's like our competitors, like all of us ended up talking a lot more during this market because we were just trying to figure out what, what each other was seeing. So, so that was a, a struggle. I yeah. think um, the other struggle that I've had, and this is really where I want your, I would love to hear your thoughts is putting together the goals. Like I, we have put together like this idea of a compelling future and what, like when we come out of this, where we want to be, right? Like the, the types of engagements and customers we want to work with, the type of experiences we want to provide, the type of internal opportunities we want to provide to our team uh, when we start growing again. I think one of the challenges has been there's so much market uncertainty. We want to put together clear goals and we want to be able to track to those goals to be able to show that progress. But sometimes it's like, it's, it can be difficult because it's like hard sometimes to put together goals in a specific time frame when there's so much uncertainty. So do you have any advice in terms of like when you're putting together goals or like when you're trying to get the team excited and it, they, you feel like you need to give them easy wins, but you also feel like you don't know exactly what's happening in the market. And maybe some of the strategy you're trying to do is like new, right? Like you haven't yeah. necessarily done. It. So it might shift, right? As you grow and you learn more. So how do you do that? Like that's, I know it's a tough question to answer. Oh, but, it's, yeah. it's a good, it's a good question. And I think it kind of goes back to in, in times of uncertainty, how and what do you communicate? And I think I, I've seen, um, I've seen a challenge in, um, in certain companies where they try and get too rosy. They try and, they try and sell you on, this is it. Like we've, we've gotten through the tough part. Now it's all, now it's all easy as long as we sort of do X, Y, and Z, but behind the scenes, maybe they don't really know that. And I, and like one a quote I remember from, uh, I think it's Thomas Friedman said, the job of a leader during times of uncertainty is to put more truth into the world and putting truth into the world is, is part um, what you know, and what you don't know. So if we don't know what the market's going to be later in the year, we can't really plan that far out. We can plan out next week you know like we can plan out what do we know we know we know what's today what what today is about we know what our goals are today we know maybe we know what the rest of the month is about and team this is it this is going to be the mode for us for for the for as long as we can see and so if you're here with us it's just going to be kind of uncertain for a bit and so now I'm being transparent with you and you can either sign up for that or not but but I don't know. I can't commit to you that like the pain isn't isn't done yet. I can't commit to you that like you know that that we're like in in the clear yet. But I can. Here's what I can tell you. I can tell you what we know. I can tell you what our clients are. I can tell you what our needs are. I can tell you what an opportunity is that we have right in front of us. And let's focus there. 
Because I think if you can focus the team on what you know, what you don't know, like the, the, the line of sight that you have, which is maybe just 30 yards out or it's 30 days out, hmm. if we can focus on that and we can do really well at that, then that gives us as, as good a chance as we, we can possibly hope for. Yeah, I think that so that's one thing that I have been doing is, is like we're just incredibly transparent on what we're seeing out there and where we are, our standing is as a company. And also just saying that like this could fluctuate, like I'm telling you this today. But when we have our next all hands, it might be something different. So we just have to, you know, to be clear, like, and particularly if we have a win <laughs> where things seem to be moving in the right direction, I try to like, I'm qualifying that. I'm like, guys, we're not out of the woods yet. Yeah. Like, this is, this is good. We've stabilized or this is good. We've, we got this customer on board or this customer came back. So even if it's like genuinely good news, I yeah. try to put proper expectations because I don't want people to feel blindsided on the next all hands if I have to give news that you know, isn't positive. And so that's like one thing I've learned too. It's like, as you're, as you're thinking about like, okay, when something goes wrong, it's like, what's the plan in the short term to try to overcome that. But when something goes right, also ensuring that people know it's like, okay, but we're still not out of the woods yet. Right. Like we have to deliver and execute on this. And then the other thing that I, uh, I've been doing is sharing a lot of our long-term strategy, right? Like because it's really interesting about this year is that there's, we've had actually a lot of incredible wins when it comes to our like overarching strategy. Like we're putting together like an incredible board. We're revamping our entire kind of like revenue strategy for how we're getting going out to market. Um, we're we're like kind of redefining and honing in on like an, a new, like our uh, ideal customer profile that we think is aligned with the company's North Star metrics. And we have the right advisory team in place to help us actually reach that. And there's like this, all this stuff happening. And then there's like the reality of a PL. Yeah. And it's like, and then trying to balance those things, like, hey, here's all the cool stuff that we're doing. Here's the reality of our financial situation. Like, so it's it's just a, it's an interesting balancing act, right? Like it's you want folks to yeah. see the future and be excited. And it's also like being transparent about the reality of 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 the PL to some extent, right? Yeah, I think this is a, this is a hard thing, um, particularly for founders. So it's like, hey, this is the company that I started, and I, I look around a lot of these people. I convince these people to join. Um, a, a lot of a lot of founders are just like they've you know they haven't built the scar tissue on this. This could be the first time that they've like, hey, my my first company I've ever started, and the first rough patch we've started, and there can be this psychological pull to try and paint a rosy picture because I'm looking around the Zoom and I see some grave faces here on Zoom, so. I'm going to try some, some raw, raw stuff here. I'm going to like, I'm going to, I'm going to amp people up with like, I'm going to oversell this one win we just had. And because it's a natural human reaction to, to the team that I've got right now, I want them firing all cylinders and feeling good. But, but the, the reality is what's, what's, what they more need. That's maybe what they want or what you think they want, but what they need more is as much objectivity as possible. Right. And object, objectivity is is tempered in terms of like, okay, well, here's what's going on. Here's what we don't know. Here's what we got to do next. Um, and here's some here's a challenge I think we face as a company and I need your help in it. So can we engage the team that we have in any way to sort of chew on something that we see as a problem? Maybe it's maybe it's a customer retention issue that is like keeping us all up at night. Maybe it's, but it, can we engage them in a way where we're being transparent about the biggest challenge, biggest opportunities, the biggest challenge and there's ways for them to engage on it if they if they want to. Because um, I think when there's a problem out there and I just have no control over it, I'm just going to be I'm going to be sleepless tonight on this problem. Then then why why do I really expose you to too much of that versus expose you to a little bit of it? Um, and that might be de dependent upon the team that you've got. You know, like maybe I expose the customer team to the customer retention issue, but not the whole company. But, um, you know, I think that that sort of being objective and to the extent that we can engage them on, on what we think are things that like they can have an impact on, um, that also, you know, makes them feel a bit more comfortable because like, you know, I'm trusted, I'm trusted to sort of weigh in on these things. Right, for sure. I mean, I, um, I, I've been pretty, like, very transparent on uh, you know, our situation as, as, the, uh, as the situation in tech has progressed. And I mean, it's always like, it's positive feedback. Like people are like, Hey, I really, we really appreciate the transparency. It's not like it's, if anything, employee engagement is, is going up. People are rallying together. They're working hard. We've dialed in, like we try to keep it really simple and focus on customer experience uh, and, and just like doing what filling in however we can to help. I mean, 
you know, for instance, like thinking outside the box, like you were talking about with your recruiting team, uh, you've seen a company like reallocate uh, or your, your friend's recruiting team sounds like reallocating their recruiting staff to kind of billing out to another company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the random stuff things that we did was, you know, we have a customer that uh, is on a, uh, you know, has a, a couple of uh, folks from us currently on, on their team uh, embedded. Their recruiting needs have dropped, not completely ended, but they have, they've reallocated some of our recruiters' times into other functions. Like, I think actually, you know, we have one of our recruiters is doing some SDR work about half of their time. And that comes down to like our company, like thinking outside the box, it comes down to having a culture of people that don't see their job as a JD and are willing to do what it takes. And it like, it was centered around like being transparent about this is where we're at. We need to produce, you know, incredible customer experiences, whatever it takes. And then the way that that's delivered upon is the employees kind of bought into saying, I can make a real difference here and is willing to do things that are outside the normal scope. And I don't know if I could have gotten that buy-in from my team to, to do those type of things yeah. without being transparent and say like, hey, we got to figure this out. On the other end of this like jungle with all this stuff in it that's trying to kill us is a ton of opportunity, right? Like we're seeing a ton of consolidation in the space, a lot of competitors selling for pennies on the dollar. Like it's just, you know, highways just like, it, you know, it's, it's, it's getting there's less and less traffic. And when we get to the other side of this thing, we're going to be able to go and, and crush it. So it's been incredible to see the response from my team, uh, quite honestly. And yeah, it all comes back to the transparency and I, yeah, just being creative. Like the example I gave could be 100% different, like completely different than what another company does. Right. But, you know, maybe there is a way to get creative with how we're leveraging our team, either customer facing or not. Yeah. Uh, to to make sure that we can, you know, hopefully keep great people on board without having to make additional cuts. So, yeah, and and you so you you have you have folks that are really highly engaged. And it sounds like you're you're doing a great job to to build the trust. And and so it goes back to engagement and or as what Steve will call like I think he thinks of emotional commitment as like the the sort of gold standard. And so even in tough times, if we've got a good portion of the staff who are like highly engaged or they're, they're committed, they're mission aligned, you know, some of the best ideas for how we're going to navigate these tough times are going to come from them, you know? And so, uh, you know, that's why having a pulse on your engagement right after a tough time is really important. Um, and where, what can we do to improve it? Because again, I, I think you might have some sales process conversion flow fix that someone comes up with and they're, because they're engaged and like, they believe there's psychological safety for them to like weigh in with this idea and someone trusts them and have a manager who's encouraging them. And, and so that, that comes from all of that, that engagement and emotional commitment, which is going to be at risk after a tough change. So that's when it becomes even important to have a, a maybe more important to have a pulse on it. All right. So I think like for the final segment, what I want to get into is when the market actually rebounds, right? So you enter this growth phase again, which in tech can be pretty damn aggressive, right? You go from uh, you know, kind of this like plateau or slow stage or this uh, tough uh, period to damn, okay, we, we're having a really hard time keeping up with everything. What are some of the biggest challenges you see when the company is like making that transition back into growth mode, back into like everybody's kind of struggling to fulfill demand and to grow fast enough and to make sure the right people are in, involved and you're hitting the right mi milestones and taking advantage of the growth market? Um, I, I'd just be curious to, to learn like what are, where are the biggest like um, traps for, for companies to fall into or mistakes that could be made? And then what are like some high leverage things that leadership should be thinking about to actually take advantage of the growth when, when the market shifts? Well, I think one of the, the kind of most obvious traps is like, if you look back on every headline of every layoff, it's we hired too much. And, and so during a growth phase, we hired too much and we realized we built this company the wrong way. So when, and if that day, I mean, it will, but when, when, when it arrives, when sort of VC capital is there and like the stock market and sort of growth is just exploding, um, it is, it is like forgetting that we just went through this period where we didn't really have guardrails. We didn't, there was not enough tough questions. And so, um, suddenly, suddenly the, the headcount planning process looks a lot looser, you know, that there's a lot less questions being asked around, well, why are you hiring all these people? What are they going to do? Like the, these all have these, all these people have the same job titles. What are they doing in this one office? Why do you need that many? 
um, the the lull, the the pull is going to go towards not asking those questions because because growth. If we're in high growth mode, it's like reduce reduce the the sort of the parking brake, you know, and and let everyone go. So I think that's the biggest trap is not growing sustainably and reducing the urge to just sort of you know kind of slow roll headcount growth so that like we can really make sure we've seen whether uh, there's other people in this company or there's other ways to do this more efficiently or more effectively without you know throwing a new army at it i think that's the big one i think potentially an another one is this pen pendulum of culture shifts that you know great resignation we're super progressive we believe in all these things we're going to give all our employees all these things and then we're pulling them away and then we're growing again and now we're going to throw all these things out there that creates this whiplash for people around what culture do we think we have here and what's what's really important if we're going to start to do things that are suddenly progressive again because there's money there to do it like connecting it to fewer and higher impact initiatives so choose something, whether it's social impact, whether it's something as like mental health, it's something about the culture that is aligned to the consumers that we serve. Be focused, be focused even in that, in the culture, as opposed to trying to bite off a lot more than you can chew. I think people teams get into this problem a lot where they're, they're, they're choosing too many goals. People team will get flooded with goals in high growth mode of doing all these things because of growth that we need to have these systems and processes in order to fuel this growth. And the people team will just grind to a halt because they're biting off more they can chew. That's a really interesting point. I think you're right. I think that there's this where, you know, people teams, leaders are looking at, okay, how do we attract the best talent? Other companies are offering all these things. You feel like, okay, in order to compete, we need to offer all these things. But maybe it's like, let's pick two or the three highest leverage things that maybe we also know we can actually deliver on in a recession environment opposed to like doing too much that we can't commit to on an ongoing basis. So at least from a cultural perspective, it's like, not only is there a rift, but like the people that are remaining are getting less. And it's like when they really need the mental health support is when they have the least <laughs> resources, which is not funny. It's just like, it, there is, it's just like kind of insane when you think about it. It's just like, that's when, you really need this stuff. And that's usually when it gets pulled. Um, I think that that's right. It's like picking fewer things, making it more mission driven. I mean, you have to be competitive. Like there's a balancing act, but you don't need like 10 different things. We got this, 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 and that. I mean, it's more than people can even remember off the top of their head, right? Yeah, that's it. I think that, that, that to me is, it would be the biggest thing I'd be concerned about is just a lack of focus once growth returns. Um, and, and yeah. we go right back to where we were with all these headlines. So, yeah, for sure, man. That's a, that's a really good point. Well, look, I, D David, this has been a really fun conversation. We're coming up on time here. I wanted to, to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. A lot of value. And uh, I know you're going to be guiding talent strategy for a lot of folks tuning in. Thank you so much, James. Thanks for having me. For sure. And for everybody tuning in, make sure to take this episode, drop it in Slack channels, share with your network. A lot of really good stuff here. And we'll talk to you next time. Take care.